College Television in Waleska, Georgia. From Reinhardt College in Waleska, Georgia, this is Renewing American Civilization. In this, the eighth of ten class presentations, Congressman Newt Gingrich, an adjunct professor at Reinhardt College, will continue his course, which presents the foundational principles necessary to the renewal of American civilization. This week's lesson, The World Market, focuses on the world market and an information age third wave American strategy for being the highest value added competitor with the most productive jobs, the most market oriented producers, leading to the highest take home pay and the highest quality of life. Let me uh, welcome everyone this morning, and I want to welcome the students of Mind Extension University. And remind everyone who might be watching us uh, by television or on videotape that, that, uh, or audio tape, that you can mail your comments to Renewing American Civilization, Post Office Box 6008, Marietta, Georgia 30065. You can fax your comments to 404-528-9806. You can email your comments to America Online at renewam at aol.com or you can get trans cla class transcripts and other class materials available on our internet web page, which is http colon sla double slash www.pff.org. Uh, finally, for people who are into a more traditional kind of way of communicating, although I point out 800 numbers were not very traditional 30 years ago, you can order American Civilization newspaper, video, and audio tapes and course readings by calling 1-800-2-RENEW. And this course is based on the premise that there are five pillars of American Civilization. Uh, first, the historic lessons of American civilization. Second, personal strength. Third, entrepreneurial free enterprise. Fourth, the spirit of invention and discovery. And fifth, quality as defined by Edwards Deming. And in the course of this course, we take two hours with each of those pillars, and then we apply them to four areas. Uh, last week, we talked about the third wave in American civilization, the Alvin and Heidi Toffler model of a third wave of change. Uh, then we talk in this today about creating American jobs in the world market. Then next week we will talk about replacing the culture of violence and poverty with a culture of productivity and safety. And finally, uh, we'll talk about, we'll end the course with citizenship and community in 21st century America. What does all this change mean and how do we renew American civilization and what's our role in that? Now today's class is creating American jobs in the world market. And I think it's very important to see this as a dual edge, creating American jobs but doing so in the world market. And before we get to that, uh, several of you, uh, in the spirit of a certain amount of current events, it is true that in uh, weekly world news cover, Space Alien meets with Newt Gingrich. <laughs> this was not about negotiating for a bigger market than the world market. Uh, and national security prevents me from describing exactly what happened. Uh, <laughs> But since one of you brought this today, I couldn't resist starting by, uh, this is the closest to current events we've gotten in this course so far. <laughs> Just further proof that this is a diverse and creative society with people who think up a lot of strange things. By the way, I also have to say in terms of the concept of the third wave and what an extraordinary diverse civilization we are, you remember last week I talked about the notion that the Chinese word for crisis uh, is actually made of the ideogra two ideographs for uh, danger and opportunity and that when we figured this out, uh, we were going to use it about 10 o'clock Friday night preparing the class, that we did not have the ideograph. And then uh, a gentleman faxed this to us from uh, San Francisco. Now, after the class, I learned that the story gets even better. The top character is danger. The bottom character is opportunity. And that uh, this was sent to us uh, by Fred Chow, who is an 82-year-old first-generation American who immigrated from China. And he lives in San Francisco. And a friend of ours who knows uh, Fred Chow heard me say, uh, on, the, on camera heard me say, gee, we don't have this ideograph, uh, literally picked up the phone, called, and said, Fred, can you fax it to Reinhardt? And within that length of time, it got here. So pretty good deal. And, and again, an example both of how extraordinarily diverse America is and of how the information age works and how rapidly you can get things done. Now, there's a central premise to, to this particular session, and one that I think 
we don't focus enough energy and attention on as the base of much of our public policy. And that is that economic growth is vital to a free society. That it's economic growth that creates jobs, it's economic growth that creates wealth, that you can't redistribute wealth if you don't create it, that you can't have charities if you don't first have income, that you can't take care of your family if you don't have a job, and that jobs come from economic growth. That, and, and that the best way to ensure future jobs is to have a growth-oriented pattern, not to have a protective pattern. We're going to get into this and spend some time. But it's very important because the first attitude of people is to say, boy, I want to protect my current job. And that leads you, as you'll see in a minute, into a past-oriented defensive attitude. So let's start with the premise. What this two hours is about is how do we get economic growth in the 21st century? What does economic growth in jobs and take-home pay mean for Americans? Now, I want to now go to a second point, which is very controversial, but I want to assert as a fact, and I would be very glad to defend uh, either here or anywhere else. And that is that the world market is an inescapable reality. And that it will define the requirements for economic growth. And this is it's a very central debate that we have to have as a country. My point is that you cannot avoid the world market. I use the term inescapable reality. It's not about do you like it or dislike This is not about GATT and NAFTA. This is about the objective fact that all over the planet there are smart people getting up every morning competing. And that that's just an objective reality. And that they are going to have an impact on your interest rate. They're going to have an impact on your money supply. They're going to have an impact on your products. And that unless you start a design with let's look at the world market, you are not being realistic economically about who we're competing with. You can come in and say to me, boy, here we are in North Georgia. We have got a plan that will knock the socks off Tennessee. And if, in fact, it is a plan which will be drowned by Germany and China, it is irrelevant. And so as we design American economic growth, we have to start from a 21st century notion of the world partly driven by technology. You now live on a planet where you can pick up the phone, dial, direct, and reach virtually every country on the planet in real time. Now, this is an enormous change from 100 years ago. It's a big change from 30 years ago, when it was still fairly hard to make a transatlantic call. And now it's universal. You can fax worldwide. And we did during the uh, problems in Russia several years ago. People were faxing back and forth and emailing back and forth. A level of openness that was unthinkable. And that was probably unavoidable in the modern world. Somebody told me this morning that uh, they're now talking about uh, taking out dish receivers in Iran because having your own dish receiver you know, as a way of getting information. Of course, this is happening at the very moment, as Kathleen Minix was saying, when we're now inventing smaller and smaller dish receivers. Which means people will have a contraband dish receiver in their attic. I mean, it's that kind of constant effort. You know, the world's getting smaller. We are competing not just with other Americans. We're competing with Mexico and China and Japan and Germany. And we have no choice. You, you can choose what the terms of the competition are. But you can't choose the competition. You can determine how your government interfa interfaces with the competition, but you will compete somehow. In that framework, I want to suggest that a global economy is important because there is more opportunity in the world than there is in one country. And because competition within a global economy forces us to be more creative and innovative. Now, there's two points here. First of all, as a consumer, if your choice is to buy bananas grown in a hothouse in North Georgia, or to, or to buy bananas grown in Africa or Latin America, it is an economically nutty decision to buy a hothouse banana because it's just dramatically more expensive. 